after uh, the FAA essentially locked down airports in the country, all of those planes uh, made it safely to destinations. Uh, we don't know they made it to the destinations they were headed for, but they were all able to land safely. CNN's Joey Chin in Atlanta. Joey? Aaron, we're following and watching these extraordinary pictures as they still come in as we continue to watch all the events. We want to bring our viewers back to where all of this started today, and we have additional pictures to give you some additional perspective to the story we are telling you this afternoon. First up, we go back to 8.48 this morning, that is Eastern, the crash of the first hijacked airliner hit the north tower of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan in New York. You see the gaping hole and you see the black smoke that billed from the tower. Now this, actually you're looking at the picture of the second airline that uh, crashed into the second tower, the south tower as well. Now we want to move you over and show you some exclusive CNN pictures, still pictures of the second crash as it happened. You see the plane bearing in on the south tower of the Trade Center. This is United Airlines Flight 175. It was a Boeing 767 scheduled from Boston to Los Angeles, 65 people on board, and you see what happened, just sheared right into the south tower. Horrible crash, massive burst of flames. This crash occurred at four minutes after nine o'clock this morning. Again, that's New York time. Now move ahead to 10.30, 10.29 actually. The north tower had collapsed already. This is a south tower. Uh, you can see collapsing into the streets of Lower Manhattan, just falling away. We know that, as you see it there, it's just falling away, just falling out of the sky, falling into pieces all over Lower Manhattan. And so you can understand the tremendous amount of ash just dumped on Lower Manhattan today. Roughly 50,000 people work in the towers in the center area on a daily basis. And then, of course, there are additional tens of thousands of tourists who would come to the tourists who want to see the tremendous vantage point you would have from the top of the towers. The New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani has told us he does believe that there was a horrendous loss of life there, but he doesn't even want to try to guess how many people have died in New York today. Here now we want to give you the eyewitness accounts of people who saw some of what happened today. I heard the sound of a jet. Um, I assumed it was like a, you know, a Navy jet or something like that just flying by. Sometimes they'll fly very low near the World Trade Center, not, you know, not near it. Then I heard a lo large explosion. I thought it was a sonic boom. And when I heard the explosion, I looked up, and what I saw was I saw red, and I saw actually started, saw debris to start to fall down. I was so close to the building that I couldn't run away from the building, so I actually had to run towards it. If you know, the World Financial Center has got a, a rib design, so you actually have a two-by-two two space where you can actually sneak into the building and hide. Myself and one other man were there. We had our book bags over our heads. Debris was falling down about the size of this. All portions of the building were falling down. That went on for about 30 or 40 seconds, and that, for me, was the worst part of the, the, this whole experience. And maybe it was a fear for my life, my own life at that time. Well, after that stopped, I walked out myself. I didn't see anybody in the plaza, so I, nobody was hurt was in the plaza at that point. I walked to my building in the World Financial Center. I'd seen that my colleagues were evacuated the building were downstairs. Now, on the west side of the World Financial Center, which is right on the Hudson River, there's an outdoor plaza, okay? You can look over the World Financial Center and see the, the, World, the World Trade Center. We were looking back at the building in flames. This is about, this is probably five after nine, 10 after nine. And we see a second commercial jet flying extremely low, actually collide into the south tower of the building. Um, at that point, we decided just to get out of there. People were just going crazy at that point, evacuating. Um, we started to walk north and ultimately got up to here. During our walk, we saw the, um, the, the south tower collapse to the ground, decimated. And then later, the, it was very amazing to see the north tower standing there by itself after years and years and years of seeing them together. And then all of a sudden, the north tower just collapsed upon itself and just fell to the ground. It was a cloud of dust that covered all of um, downtown Manhattan, Battery Park and everything. It's phenomenal. I've never seen anything like it. The eyewitness description of the horrible scene in New York City this morning. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of that terrible tragedy, there was further chaos down in Washington. 9.45 this morning, an airliner crashing into the Pentagon, the plane which was American Airlines Flight 77, which was scheduled from Washington's Dulles Airport out to Los Angeles. The Boeing 757 hit the army side of this huge fortress that is the Pentagon. The Pentagon, of course, is not just a symbol of the nation's military might, but today is a command center, and it's all that has happened. Now, there was a fourth crash, which occurred today in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. United Airlines Flight 93 was bound from Newark in New Jersey out to San Francisco. There were 45 people on board. Authorities say there were no survivors. In all, there were four crashes, 
266 passengers and crew, and then, of course, we still have no idea how many people may have died on the ground in the course of all these catastrophes. Joining us now from Dallas, Texas, is Jeffrey Beatty. He's a counterterrorism expert who had done work on the first World Trade Center attack. That was back in 1993. As well, he's done some work for the Pentagon. Um, of course, there will be a lot of trying to read through all of this, Mr. Beatty. Is there something that you have seen in the events of today that you see as perhaps a symbol of what group might be involved or some other hallmark of terrorism here? Well, I think it's a little too early to speculate on what group might be involved, Joey. Uh, if you remember back to the Oklahoma City bombing, everyone rushed to judgment to think it was perhaps overseas-based terrorism. Now, while all the indicators are going in that direction, uh, it'd probably be prudent to just focus on the rescue efforts today and also to ask ourselves, you know, how did this happen? Uh, and kind of break down the operation and show people that this was a very low-tech but high-concept operation on the part of the terrorists. Well, describe that for us. What do you mean by that? High concept. Well, what I mean by that is, you know, Americans tend to rely on high tech. We, we look to high tech to solve most of our problems. Um, terrorists don't have high tech at their disposal to the degree that a government such as the United States has. But unfortunately, they have a lot of time. An operation such as this may have been years in the making. Uh, we don't know yet how this operation was able to go forward, but let's just, you know, break down the steps. I took a few notes on it. At some point, we all recognized that there was some intelligence failure that, you know, we've got to do better. We've done good in the past. We've improved our ability to defeat terrorism, but we're not perfect yet. And this is an example of that, to be sure. But then what happened was, the question is, how did these people get some sort of weapon onto an airplane? You know, I'm sure the FAA and the Department of Transportation and all the airports from which these aircraft were launched this morning will be taking a really hard look at that, and I'm sure we'll see some changes in the future. No, not the an airplane, step. Mr. Beatty. I mean, four aircraft. That's an awful lot in different locations. Exactly. This is a highly sophisticated approach, you know, it's, but it's not the first time we've seen that. We've seen foreign groups destroy two embassies within moments of each other a couple of years ago on the continent of Africa. So we know that our opponent is capable of this type of operation, and he demonstrated it today on our homeland. The interesting thing here, Joey, you didn't need to bring across hundreds of pounds of explosives across a border someplace to commandeer an airplane. Why did they choose these airplanes? They picked these wide-body airplanes. The fact that the World Trade Center was prepared to sustain a hit from a 707 was not a well-kept secret. They picked airplanes that were bigger than that. Also, they picked airplanes that took off from the East Coast headed to the west coast that were big airplanes full of fuel. They weren't interested in killing people on the airplanes. The airplane themselves became the bomb. And so they didn't need to bring explosives into the country. We don't know yet whether it was knives or handguns or whatever. But the next question in the step as we break down the operational acts in this attack is, how did these people get weapons onto the aircraft? And then from there, to continue it, the question is asked, what about a cockpit incursion? How is it that they were able to get into the cockpits of the aircraft, take over the controls, and as we know and have heard in the past that there are transponder codes that pilots can send if an aircraft is hijacked. From what I understand, we didn't get some of that yet, so we have to assume that the cockpits were burst into rather quickly. And I heard Judy Woodruff and others earlier infer, and I joined them in drawing the same inference, that it's highly doubtful that the pilots of these aircraft, the United Airlines pilots and the American Airlines pilots, were at the controls of these aircraft when they impacted their targets. So we have got to assume and infer that people capable of flying the aircraft, and remember these aircraft are on duty all over the world, uh, these perpetrators no doubt rehearsed this operation, rehearsed breaking into the cockpit and other locations, that they were probably piloted to the target by people capable of flying a military or a jet aircraft. Well, do, do you come think down to the do you think, I mean, I have to interrupt you to ask, do you think that perhaps in looking at the possibility of terror threats, I mean, certainly terror threats have come to this country in the past, and I'm wondering if you think perhaps we were thinking too high concept. We thought of something more elaborate, and perhaps uh, intelligence should have been focused on this kind of low-tech approach. I suppose well, hindsight you know, is 2020, but... I, I think there's a lot of good in what you're pointing out, Joey. We have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, we cannot just focus all our energies on weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, etc. We've all been talking about that, and hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on that in recent years. 
but this didn't use any weapon of mass destruction, and I'm afraid that the casualty tally could approach five figures. And that means that we've got to be to beat these people, not only high tech, but we've got to be high concept. It means we've got to work harder in planning than we have up to this point. And I know that we will. And if I could say a word about the people at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon, we've had the privilege in my company to work to support both organizations. We've trained every security officer at both locations. They knew what they were up against. They knew that they were icons, American icons, that were likely to be targeted. Excuse me, it's been an emotional day, plus it's a little yeah. hot out here. Likely to be targeted. And they did their best. But they were only one part of a system, as we've just outlined. You know, I, Doug Karpiloff, the director of life safety and security for the World Trade Center, is probably one of the premier security people in our country. Doug was always afraid of a scenario where there was a mass casualty incident at the World Trade Center and hundreds of emergency vehicles would rush to the scene. They don't have the ability to check all those vehicles to make sure that they don't pose a threat. So we're yet to determine, we've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted, whether in fact there wasn't something else at the base of the towers that in fact were the coup de grace to bring them to the ground. Mr. Beatty, we appreciate all of your insight. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave you. There are still further developments on this story. Jeffrey Beatty's company is involved in counterterrorism information, and he joined us this afternoon from Dallas. Now let's go back to New York for the latest information there in Aaron Brown. Joey, thank you. Uh, a couple of things. Um, the president is en route back to Washington, we are now told. The president had started his day in Sarasota, Florida, uh, then went to Shreveport, a military base outside Shreveport, then went to Nebraska, where the Strategic Air Command is uh, located, and now he is making his way back to Washington, and we are told the president will address the nation at some point tonight. We do not know at what time, but of course, uh, when it happens, we will carry that live as well. Uh, we're also getting reports that a second building in the complex of the Trade Center, and again, you have the two towers, but then you have a number of support buildings around it, that another of those buildings, we reported a bit ago on Building 7, we now re uh, report that there are problems in Building 5, and that may be uh, collapsing as well, but at least there is fire there. Uh, there are an enormous, there are enormous logistical problems we just look down what is 8th Avenue behind us here, which is normally, at this time of the day, packed with cars. This is rush hour people trying to get out of the city. It is empty, and the city in at least this part of the city, Manhattan, is shut down, which means that uh, thousands of people who are trying to get home, trying to get to the suburbs, trying to get to Long Island, trying to get to New Jersey particularly, that's where those trains, uh, the, what are called the PATH trains, come into New Jersey, at the, uh, from New Jersey rather, at the Trade Center. All of them stranded here. CNN's Richard Roth is down on the streets of New York and is talking to some of the people who I suspect are wondering when they will get home. Richard? People that uh, you would have seen in locations you were just examining, many thousands of them are here right now on the west side of Manhattan trying to escape from New York. Uh, New York City is uh, sending them to ferries that are taking them to uh, New Jersey. Uh, New York City bridges, we're told, are open for pedestrians. This time, we ran for a nearby parking garage to escape the approaching cloud of dust and debris. Seconds later, the World Trade Center was gone. Moyiwa Anibogi and Daphne Carlisle worked on the 82nd floor. We saw a shadow, it looked like a plane. Next thing we know, it was boom, boom, and the floor started shaking. And then we saw debris fall down, and next thing we know, we had to get out of the building. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, there's this big explosion. I thought we'd be able to unrun it, but we couldn't. It was pitch black. It was like many office workers, they survived <laughs> the initial explosion, but were nearly killed by the collapse. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just a short time ago, they brought in a number of huge cranes. You can see now lining the West Side Highway. As soon as it is safe to go in and begin removing the debris, these cranes will be brought in to do that. Clearly, uh, they will begin to look for bodies among the debris. Of course, that recovery effort will take days. A number of us from Eyewitness News were here in the moments after the attack on the World Trade Center. Let's turn it over now to Jim Hoffer who got here shortly after the attack. Jim? Well, NJ, thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me here in the uh, passing hours is just how little panic 
has taken place, what little panic at least that we've seen, considering the enormity of events here, the colossal damage that has taken place. Uh, I think you can say, at least in the early going, that New Yorkers have braved this beyond what can be expected. Photographer John Chow and I were around 10.15 this morning heading toward the last remaining tower when it suddenly crumbled right before us, changing forever the city skyline and the city's people. Just when you thought it could not get worse, it did. The second trade tower crippled by a kamikaze plane strike collapsed and sent hundreds of people running from its dangerous cloud of dust and debris. As you can see behind me, the second and last tower of the World Trade Tower has just collapsed. It is about 10.30 Eastern time. And the tower has collapsed. We did not hear an explosion. There was no sign telling us previous any kind of warning that the building was going to collapse. The warning for us were people just running in our direction. And that's when we started to get out of the way. It is a scene. It is a scene out of Dante's hell. Horrific. No World Trade Tower is standing. Time, 10.30, Lower Manhattan. And I'm standing next to John, and then the top of the thing blew up and it just exploded, started coming down. I was running for my life. And, uh, me, the fireman, John, we were just taking off, man. And just falling down behind us. It was coming up behind us. And uh, I just saw this truck, and I knew it was right behind me, and I just slid underneath it. And I thought it was John behind me, and it was a fireman. And we stayed down there, and everything just went black. Well, that New Jersey man is one of what must be innumerable heroes in this tragedy. He was able to get a woman, he and his friend, able to get a woman out of one of the towers. She was in a wheelchair. They were able to bring her down some 50 floors before that building collapsed. Although in an interview with us, as he was choking back tears, he says he didn't know whether the woman in the wheelchair was able to get far enough away from the building to, uh, to prevent any harm to her when the building did finally collapse. We're live in Lower Manhattan. Jim Hoffer, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Jim, our Joe Torres was a couple of blocks. started all over again. And again, Glenn and I were within the shadows of the World Trade Center, just one or two blocks away on the north side of the towers. We have been out on the street trying to cover the story here of the people throughout the day. We are still unsure of many of the facts that have occurred because we haven't been in front of a TV or in front of a radio. Fully hear that there was building number seven, one of the buildings uh, in support of the World Trade Center towers has collapsed. Now, those of you who have been with us for a while, you can see indeed that the smoke color has changed from a, has gotten much lighter. Uh, so we believe that yet another building, this would be the third building, has collapsed. Likely building number seven, although we also heard that uh, there were problems at building number five and it's possible that one went down too. Uh, but again, another building in the Trade Center complex appears now to have caved in after these attacks. Judy. Aaron, uh, we're looking at these pictures that uh, Tom Clancy and I, as we sit here in the, in the Washington studio, and as I, just as I come back to Tom Clancy, I want to read just a portion of a statement issued by uh, Secretary of State Powell, uh, Colin Powell, calling these attacks a terrible tragedy terrible tragedy befallen not just my nation but all the nations of this region all the nations of the world all those who believe in democracy tom clancy you were saying sure we can ask these questions about failed security failed intelligence when things go wrong but we have every right to ask these questions well no we? the first remember you have a right to say anything you want but it's a practical matter uh one of the things we have to do if you want to prevent things like this from happening is you build up your defenses and your first line of defense against terrorism is an intelligence gathering capability. 
Now, when was the last time CNN or the news media in general said, gee, we ought to put more money into the human intelligence capabilities of the CIA? Answer, you never do it. Never. Well, we wouldn't take a side on something like that. Anyway, in terms of what do you fund and... Yeah, we always take a side on saying they failed. Why well, not help them succeed once in a while? Are you saying that they are significantly underfunded in that area? And it, not just the CIA, but the FBI? Human intelligence is de-emphasized. The FBI's job is... Spying is, is what we're talking is, about. Yeah, here. that's what that's what intelligence officers do, is they spy. And the CIA has 20,000 employees, about 800 of whom are actually spooks. Of, and of them, maybe as many as two-thirds actually get outside and do spook operations. And we know that... And we need to do better than that. We need to do more than that. You gather information of this type by putting people out on the street, same way cops gather information from informants. It's not, this isn't rocket but, science. It's just a matter of hiring the people and letting them do the work. But I, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron, but my question is, how do you know what to believe? We had a, an Arab journalist in London just today saying... We had this information a few weeks ago. It was coming. We didn't know whether to believe it. Now back to Aaron in New York. Thank, thank you. We've talked a number of times today about the fact that it is, it is simply too dangerous for officials to get in and around these buildings. It's so very, very dangerous. And the proof of that, uh, just a few moments ago, when another building in the complex that is the World Trade Center or was the World Trade Center collapsed, Maureen, we can show you what that looked like. These are taped pictures uh, taken literally just a few moments ago uh, when that building went down. We are seeing them for the first time. This is, uh, correct me in the booth, but I believe that was in fact a, a piece of tape that we got just a bit ago of, a sec of the second plane hitting uh, the South Tower, the Trade Center, uh, just a little bit after nine o'clock this morning. Um, again, a, a third building at the Trade Center has collapsed within the last three or four minutes. Building number seven, this is no small building as you can see at 47 stories. It would stand out in most American cities. Uh, it looks small, I guess, in, when you look at what was the 100 plus stories of the World Trade Center, but building number seven, it's 40 plus stories, almost 50 stories collapsing as well. And if we can go back to the tape and see it one more time, and I'll look at it with you. Wow. Oh my gosh. I wonder, this, this comes to us from PAX TV. I wonder, uh, guys, if we can recue that in a moment and show that again. You see the, the fire coming out of the first building there, the plane on the lower left side of your screen. And it looks to me, and I'll confess I don't have the greatest monitor here, but you could almost see the nose of that plane coming through the other side of the building. Uh, that may have been an illusion as we looked at it here, but that's how it looked to us as the flames. These are fully loaded uh, planes, fully loaded with jet fuel. They were headed from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast, so they had an enormous amount of jet fuel. Jeffrey Beatty, a security consultant, said to us a little bit ago, this was low-tech, high-concept. The plane was the bomb, and you just saw the bomb go off. That was around 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, uh, I, that, would, that was around 9 o'clock this morning. And shortly after that, that plane with Ms. Olson and many more crashed at the Pentagon. General Wesley Clark joins us from Little Rock. General Clark has been with us a number of times today. Uh, General, I, I wonder if you will weigh in for a second on this debate or this discussion that has been going on for most of the afternoon here, which is have we misapplied in some ways intelligence resources that we have, we have become so infatuated with what we can do with machines and high tech that we have inappropriately, I guess, uh, spent less money, less time, less effort on uh, the down and dirty human intelligence. Well, that's certainly a question that everyone is going to be asking and it will be asked in official channels and it will be asked to those who are best in a position to give that answer. My experience with it has been that I've heard this charge now for some 25 years in the intelligence business, and we have put emphasis into not only technical intelligence, but human intelligence. But you know, it's very hard to get the kind of specific intelligence that would prevent something like this. 
Many of these people are members of a family. They come from a specific village, perhaps. Their background is known and vetted. They're carefully controlled. Their movements and communications are monitored. And it's difficult, no doubt, for any intelligence organization, no matter how well it's resourced and how courageous its members to penetrate an organization like that and give us information. Intelligence is, is always characterized by a failure to know what you don't know. And I'm sure that we'll make improvements. There are always more things that could be done in the aftermath of something like this. But if there's one single message that comes through to me here, and I think will come through to many others, it's that it's not enough simply to put up the best defenses against terrorism, but that more active measures are, are no doubt called for, particularly in this case. When you say uh, more active members, measures, you're talking about proactive? That's right, preemptive measures. We've known a number of these groups have for a long time said they declared war on the United States. And we have dealt with them, we've fenced with them, we've cooperated with other governments against them, we've chased individuals, we've hauled some into court. But I think that not only do we have to ask ourselves, could we have learned more in this specific case, we have to also ask ourselves, could we have done more if we've been, been willing to take greater risks, if we've been willing to take more extraordinary measures earlier to take some of these groups and these individuals at their word that they had declared war on us and they deserved to be taken seriously and they merited some preemptive action. And just perhaps stating the obvious, sir, when you talk about preemptive action, first of all, you got to be able to find the people you're taking the action against. Do we know where the right people are so that if, we're, if the country is going after these people, they get the right people? Well, I think that's always the problem. And uh, there will always be a certain degree of uncertainty, and there will be a certain degree of concern about this. The best way to handle any international terrorist organization is to arrest its leaders present the evidence and have them tried in a court of law. And that certainly is the way anyone would prefer to deal with this. But perhaps in some cases, it's not possible to do that or it's not possible to do that quick enough. We'll have to ask those questions in the aftermath. It's not simply about intelligence, it's also about acting on intelligence. I mean, ultimately, sir, this is not simply a military or an intelligence question. This is a core political question. It, is, it really has to do with how we see ourselves in a country, whether we are willing to take the risk that some innocents uh, may, be, may perish because of what we as a country do, and that that's a political question for the country to deal with. It's a profound political question, and I think it's also a question for the international community, because an event like this is a, a real cry for alarm and recognition in the international community. A tragedy like this can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And international terrorism is too dangerous and too uh, ambiguous and, and too difficult for any single nation to handle by itself. We need strong, reliable support from friends and allies around the world, and I'm sure we'll be asking for it. And clearly one of the things that ought to come from this is not only better U.S. intelligence, it's better sharing of information, pooling of information with our partners in all corners of the globe. General Clark, thanks again uh, for joining us as you have a number of other times today and I suspect you will again before the day is out. General 945, another hit. A commercial plane crashes into the Pentagon. 951, taking no chances, the Federal Aviation Administration grounds all takeoffs and landings and reroutes incoming international flights to Canada. And the Pentagon soon upgrades its terrorism alert status to Delta, the highest possible level. 10 a.m., back in New York, the Trade Center's South Tower crumbles to the ground. 10.29, the North Tower collapses. These buildings were once the tallest in the world. 
home to the city's financial district, is shrouded in smoke, dust. They send just that signal, and that is their ability to strike at the heart of American power. Uh, the Pentagon being the heart of American military power, uh, the World Trade Center being in Lower Manhattan the heart of the nation's economic power. Uh, both of these structures, the Pentagon and the World Trade Center, in addition uh, being great symbols of, of, of the cities, great symbols of, of, of America, um, their ability to strike those is intended to create alarm and panic throughout the United States. And in fact, there have been closings of businesses, of schools, of all sorts of things all over the country in the course of this day because of these assaults. I'm wondering if you can give us any of your perspective. Obviously, you don't have a crystal ball to look at these things, but should we regard this as being done at this point? It has been silent for much of the rest of the day since this morning. One has to be very, very careful uh, in looking at a multiple coordinated attack like this to to say exactly when it was when it is over. I mean, it was uh, 31 years ago, almost to the day, that in a single day three airliners were hijacked. Uh, one of the hijackings uh, failed, but the other two airliners, plus a an airliner that was hijacked on the following day were flown to Desert Airfield in Jordan where the hijackers, members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, uh, held uh, the hostages for a number of days. All right, Mr. Jenkins, I'm sorry to have to interrupt you here. We do have some late developments. Uh, as you see at the bottom of your screen, there are reports from CNN's Nick Robertson in Kabul, Afghanistan, of explosions there. I want to get some additional information now. CNN's Aaron Brown from his rooftop vantage point in New York. Oh, and actually, this is Nick Robertson now in Kabul. Uh, Nick, what can you tell us out there? Well, Jerry, it's about 2.30 in the morning here in Kabul. We can hear explosions around the perimeter of the city. We're in a position here which, allow, which gives us a view over the whole city. We just heard an impact uh, perhaps a few miles away. If I listen, you can hear the ripple of explosions around the city. Perhaps we've heard there the fifth explosion, sixth explosion, I see gun bursts and star bursts in the air. Tracer fire is coming up out of the city. I hear aircraft flying above the city of Kabul. Perhaps we've heard uh, half a dozen to ten detonations on the perimeter of the city, some coming from the area close to the airport. I see on the horizon what could be a fire on the horizon close perhaps to where the airport might be. A flash came up then from the airport. Uh, some ground fire coming up here in Kabul. A lot of flashing uh, reflecting off clouds uh, towards the horizon here. We thought that might have been a thunderstorm before. The detonations we're hearing now much louder than a thunderstorm. Also uh, detonations very similar to those caused by large missiles. I've been in Belgrade and I've been in Baghdad and seen cruise missiles arrive in both those cities. The detonations we're hearing in, uh, in Kabul right now certainly have sound like uh, the detonations of loud missiles that are coming in. We do see tracer fire going up into the air uh, and hear the detonations towards the perimeter of the city, heavy air detonations we can hear now. It's what sounds like a lot of anti-aircraft fire going up. Uh, multiple detonations uh, we can hear in the air. I'll try and be quiet for a moment, see if we can pick up some of those sounds coming in from the perimeter of the city, Joey. Very quiet at this, at this particular moment. The city still uh, trace of fire, rockets going up around the airport, trace of fire flying across the city in the direction of the airport. The city at this stage still very well illuminated. The electricity supply is still on in the city, illuminating the city. Uh, detonation coming in from uh, towards the airport. Multiple detonations now going off again towards the perimeter of the city in the direction of the airport. We see one fire on the horizon at this moment. Uh, Kabul is surrounded by mountains. The detonations reverberate from those mountains, so it's difficult to get a, 
difficult to get an accurate fix uh, on exactly where the impacts are happening. Certainly, uh, our certainly it would appear that the Afghan defense systems have detected a threat in the air. They are launching uh, what appears to be anti-aircraft defense systems at the moment. Certainly, I can see that fire that was blazing on the horizon. It was a, a faint yellow. It's now a bright orange blazing. Uh, several other detonations uh, going off around the city, multiple areas. Rockets appear to be taking off from one end of the airport. I can see that's perhaps located about eight or nine miles away from where we stand, Joey. Nick, we want to ask you uh, to keep, please keep your line up to us. We're, we're having difficulty reaching you on another line, but please keep your line up. We can see the pictures coming to us by the video phone. Again, this is very advanced technology that CNN is using, but you will see some of the digital effect. It is not quite as clear as your average television signal, and so to our viewers, we apologize for that. But this is certainly the only video that you're going to get from Kabul, Afghanistan at this point, and you're watching it on CNN. Again, we are hearing from our correspondent, Nick Robertson, who is on the scene in Kabul with his team there, and he has reported the sounds of tracer fire. He has reported the fire burning there in Kabul, the seat of Afghanistan's power, the seat of the Taliban government. Uh, again, we are watching their picture coming to us on the video phone, and it is very hard, of course, to see exactly what you're looking at. But you are looking at Kabul. Again, you see some tracer fire there coming across the scene. Nick Robertson, can you, yeah. can you Joey, hear us? We're being, we're being told. Jo Joey, I, Joey, I can, Joey, I can hear you. If you can hear me, certainly big detonation there, missiles flying across the city. We're being told from sources in Kandahar, that's the spiritual capital of Afghanistan, 300 miles south of here, that there is uh, no uh, rocket activity like this south of here in Kandahar, certainly in Kabul, very, very active at this stage, multiple detonations. It is nighttime here, it is dark, it is difficult to get an accurate fix on exactly what we're seeing and exactly what we're hearing. Certainly the sound, what appears to be the sound of large missiles incoming and landing in the city. Certainly a big fire on the horizon of the city at the moment. Uh, and certainly anti-aircraft fire uh, coming up from the city and rockets being launched uh, and flying across the horizon of the city. Uh, rockets perhaps going at the speed of uh, several hundred miles an hour, the sort of speed that one might expect to see uh, cruise missiles traveling across the horizon at burning with a, a, a white glow coming from their tails rather than, rather than a yellow glow. The fire on the uh, horizon that we can see from here burning furiously now. Uh, perhaps it would be accurate at this stage to suspect that that was a fuel dump that's been hit uh, by the way that it's burning, flames leaping, and that fuel dump must be perhaps five to eight miles from where I am. Flames leaping up from that fuel dump now leaping up right into the air. Um, it was a low burning fire before, but it has now really increased in its ferocity, perhaps indicating that it is a fuel dump. Looking across the rest of the city, uh, that fuel dump, perhaps the only big fire we can see at this time. From our vantage point here at the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel that overlooks the whole of the city of Kabul that is in a basin surrounded by mountains, uh, the, the whole city is laid out in front of us. The gunfire that was coming up from the city seems to have subsided for now. We're not hearing any more detonations at this moment. And as I say, the fire on the horizon really burning uh, furiously at this time, flames leaping way up in the air this moment. Joey? Nick, if you can talk to us a little bit about your circumstance. It is 6 o'clock in the evening here in Atlanta. It must be quite late at night there in Kabul. Indeed, 2.30 uh, in the morning uh, here, Joey, we're eight and, a, eight and a half hours ahead of East Coast time in the United States. Uh, and it was about uh, five hours ago that the Foreign Minister of Afghanistan, Ahmed uh, Wakil, Ahmed Mutawakil, brief journalist, I hear more detonations going off now. Um, he said that the Taliban had not taken precautions against uh, the like against the possibility uh, of there being an air attack against afghanistan he said because it was not necessary uh, the taliban spiritual leader mullah omar 
had also made a statement saying that they felt Osama bin Laden wasn't responsible for what had happened in the United States. He said his country was a peaceful country. He wanted it to be at peace, and he wanted uh, peace in other countries around the world. Certainly what we're seeing in Kabul uh, in these early hours of this Wednesday morning is very far from peace. Uh, certainly multiple explosions happening in and around the city. We, there is a front line uh, about 50 miles north of the city where the uh, Taliban are fighting a, a battle against the, uh, the Northern Alliance here. We could hear detonations coming from that uh, northern area as well. But on the perimeter of the city, particularly in the direction of the Kabul airport, which is about five to eight miles from where we are, detonations coming from there. I remember standing on this balcony about four years ago watching, uh, watching fighter jets bomb that airport as part of Afghanistan's ongoing civil war. The uh, flash uh, at the airport to us hearing the detonation at the hotel is about the same duration. So I, I am using that as an estimate uh, to gauge that those missiles again are falling in the area of the airport. First, we're seeing the flash and then we hear the detonation some several seconds afterwards, and they appear to be coming from that airport area, in some cases uh, several miles away from us. There is still uh, a lot of flashing uh, we can see in the air reflected off clouds. That could be thunder and lightning. However, there's a possibility that those reflections and missiles landing elsewhere uh, the flashes as they explode and reflecting off the clouds. But it's not a good indication. We certainly don't hear uh, any detonations coming from that particular direction at this time. Um, the anti-aircraft fire that we were seeing a little while ago is not uh, coming up from the city. The city, uh, apart from the detonations we were hearing a few minutes ago, appears very, very calm. The visibility here is excellent. We can see all the way across the city. It lies on a plain that's surrounded by the mountains here in Kabul. We have high mountains to the right. These mountains were used by the Mujahideen as vantage points for shelling the city uh, several years ago during the Mujahideen infighting in Kabul. The last five years, the Taliban have been in control of this city, have been trying to extend their control over and across Afghanistan. And the foreign minister this evening uh, telling journalists and CNN that he didn't believe that the Afghanistan would be attacked he said if Afghanistan was attacked, then they would call it, the Taliban would call it, an act of state-sponsored terrorism, Joey. All right, that is CNN's Nick Robertson. Again, please keep the line open to us, Nick Robertson, there in Kabul, Afghanistan, for our viewers who are watching this with us on the air. Again, this is we're getting this from video phone technology. You're seeing this exclusively on CNN. It is a very new technology, and so you, you could tell from the audio line, it is not as clear as our typical TV feed, and the visuals obviously are not as clear, but you are looking at the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. This is the seat uh, of, the, uh, of the Taliban government. They are not a spiritual center, but it's government center in any case. Uh, you are seeing in just about the last 10 minutes, we have been hearing these reports from CNN correspondent Nick Robertson on the ground in Kabul, of an explosion you see on the right side of your screen about a third of the way over the flames of fire they were quite large just a short time ago seem to have simmered down but again we're just not seeing very much of this because it's uh, the video phone again nick robertson saying that they had seen tracers going up as well uh, they have been listening and hearing the possibility of additional explosions elsewhere they're trying to follow that but it's a little bit hard to tell again it is 2 30 in the morning in kabul and uh, Nick Robertson continues to watch there. Now let's turn to Judy Wood.